Today's lessons echo a larger message that's found throughout the Gospel of Luke. So one of the things people are starting to notice is I'm talking a heck of a lot about money in this last year. And it's not because there's a capital campaign coming up. No, in fact, what it is, is that the Gospel of Luke is focused like a laser on issues of poverty. That's just, you know, on, on one hand, like Mark, the Gospel of Mark is all about, you know, you got to make sure that we know there's spiritual forces out there. And you have to deal with spiritual forces in some way, shape, or form. And Matthew wants to make sure we know that this Christianity thing is still following the footsteps of Judaism. It's not a clean break. But Luke, Luke wants to make sure we know how, how to deal with money, how to deal with poverty and with riches, and to, to know that at the end of the day, Jesus was on the side of the poor. So, so, for example, to the poor, they hear Jesus came into the world while his mother sang about the hungry being fed. He came to preach good news to the poor. He constantly extended the kingdom of God to those who had been cast out, to the blind, to the lame, and yes, to the poor. And today, in, in the, book, the letter to Timothy, we read about contentment and godliness not coming from the coin. That, that's an important message to, to poor folk. Likewise, today the prophet Amos reminds us, reminds them, reminds those who are poor in whatever way we are defining that, that God sees injustice and God calls it out for what it is, that it's a false sense of security, it's a trap, and it's a sin. And to the Lazaruses of the world, Jesus' parable points out that God doesn't just see injustices, but also God sees those who are victims of injustice. And he even name, knows their name, knows them by name. Lazarus is in case you hadn't noticed it, you hadn't been going through all the parables in the Bible, he is the only character in any parable that is in fact named. All the other ones are, you know, the, the rich man does this, the, the king does that, the tax collector does this, but in this parable, Lazarus is named. This poor man who is ignored by everyone except the dogs is named by the one who has a name above all names, Jesus Christ. He's named, and not only that, Lazarus is seen. Now, I've had a few homeless friends in my day, and every single one of them says that the worst part about being homeless is people pretend that you're invisible. It's like you, you get an invisibility cloak when you become homeless. You, you simply cannot be seen. They, people avert their eyes, they, they walk a little quicker, they just pretend like you're not there. Well, to those that, that have been invisible, those in poverty, let it be known to them, God sees you. God really sees you. As for the rich, they are frequently told in the Gospel of Luke about camels not being able to pass through the eye of a needle, and likewise, rich people can't enter the kingdom of heaven. They're told about storing up treasures only to die. They're told about rich rulers being unable to follow Jesus. And today, the prophet Amos calls us, calls them, onto the carpet. He reminds the rich that they have an immense power to shape society for the good. Their nation is at a crossroads. And it's at the point of calamity. But they can still repent and reverse things. Yet the rich of his day prefer to entertain themselves to death. It's as if they're, they're on, the, on the Titanic. And they can see, see the iceberg that they're about to hit. But instead, they choose to fiddle with the deck chairs and drink pina coladas. For that matter, in our gospel lesson, it paints the rich in a very rough color. The rich man refuses to see, refuses to care for his neighbor in need. 
And this rich man fails to repent, even in hell. He assumes his wealth meant something, even in hell. He thinks he can order Lazarus around, even in hell. Riches in this parable are truly hellish. Then, when we look at the letter to Timothy, we're warned that riches are a trap, that they, they are held onto and evaporate. We can trust in, if we easily trust in wealth in order to find our worth. And we do so over against everybody else. In our wealth, we, we, we find status. But ultimately, trusting in wealth, we, we both lose respect for other people and also lose our own value and worth that is beyond wealth, beyond what we own and what we have. Wealth can be corrosive to our faith. So far, a pretty tough message to uh, anybody who, who considers themselves wealthy, yes? But don't despair, my 1% friends. God loves you too. You see, we find here in Timothy that all that is necessary for the good life is from God. Remember your large catechisms. It rains on both the just and the unjust. God provides bread enough for all, as long as it's used and shared well. Ultimately, recognizing that all we have, everything that is ours, I and mean, Luther goes so far as to talk about our shoes, about our, our land, our spouses, all this stuff is ultimately bread from heaven. It's given to us by grace through no works of our own. That is the key to this all. It is, to quote St. Augustine, the very commerce of the city of God. We do not so much buy and sell as we receive and as we give. Receiving from God, but not holding on to it. Instead, being rich in goodness and rich in generosity. That is where true riches lie. Scripture's message to those in poverty and in wealth, no matter where the line is drawn, from the 1% to the 80%, is clearly too complex for any one sermon. But there are some strands that we can kind of pull out of today's lessons. So to the rich, you are called to responsibility and to remembrance of where the source of your riches are from God ultimately. To the poor, you are seen and you are named. Amen and hallelujah. Have you heard the one about the duck? There is a duck.